All right, section 4.4 is called the definite integral. Um, what we're going to see happen today is we're going to see putting numbers on top of these script S's that you've been using. Um, and then the next section in 4.5 will connect that notation with what this section does and what you've done back in 5.1. Okay, 4.1, the right section, 4.1. All right, so let's take a look. To start with, we're going to define the word integrable. For any function f defined on the interval from a to b, the definite integral of f is this notation where you have the script s. Notice now we've got numbers, a and b are numbers, the top and the bottom. And what this is, it's, it's a limit of the summation from i equal 1 to n. That's that summation notation we saw back in 4.2 of the function f of c sub i times delta x. Whenever the limit exists, it's the same no matter what point we choose to evaluate at, left end point, right end point, midpoint, or something else. <coughs> and when this limit exists, we say that f is integrable on a, b. Fill those details in, and then I'll tell you how that relates to this idea of rectangles that we did back in 4.3. Yeah, I think it was 4.3 where we did that. When I taught this section on rectangles, right, where I made the rectangles between 0 and 2 or whatever, most of the examples we did had four rectangles, right? Okay, and part of me describing that to you is because um, I didn't really want there to be that many more rectangles because it starts to be tedious, correct? You guys remember that? But let's think for a moment. What would happen if instead of four rectangles we had eight rectangles? What would happen to our approximation of that area under the curve? would get a better approximation or a worse approximation? Better, right? If I had eight rectangles instead of four, I'd get a better approximation. What happens if I make it 16 rectangles? It's better, right? So in general, right, the more rectangles I had, the better approximation I would get. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay, so what you're seeing in this description right here is you're seeing, oops, that's not what I meant to circle. This right here telling me that what's happening to my rectangles? I get more of them. That's all that notation is saying. So visually, what you want to picture is you want to picture these rectangles becoming really, really skinny and there being infinitely many of them. Can you picture that happening? And if you let the number of rectangles get infinitely large, then the approximation gets infinitely better. So far, so good. So what this is telling you is that this integral notation from A to B is that process of letting those rectangles get infinitely many between our endpoints. So far, so good with the description? Now, but the reality is we don't really want to calculate infinitely many rectangles, agreed? No, I, I don't anyway, maybe you do, but I do not want to calculate a whole bunch of rectangles. All right, so, but if we were able to do that, we would get an infinitely better, or it, 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 eventually we would get an accurate area under the curve. And when that happens, when we're able to do that, we call that function integrable. Okay, so do you have the conceptual idea, like we're not legitimately going to make infinitely many rectangles, but do you have the conceptual idea of what's happening <coughs> under your curve? Okay, fantastic. All right, one more theorem, and then we're going to show, I'm going to show you how this actually, or two more, I'm sorry, and then I'm going to show you how this actually works. All right, theorem 4.1 says that if you have a function that's continuous, then it's integrable. that should feel like a definition or a theorem we've had before, <coughs> where it says if you have a function that's continuous, it's differentiable. Do you guys remember that? This is a one direction statement. So the notation that we use in logic when we have a statement like this is it, it looks, okay, my pen's not working quite right. There we go is that it's one direction. It says if the first part happens, then the second part follows. It doesn't necessarily mean that you can go the other direction. Just because it's integrable doesn't necessarily mean that it was continuous. 
Okay, so be careful with the definition. It goes this direction only. It's the only guarantee you have. So if you've got something continuous, you know you can integrate it. You know it's integrable. All right, theorem 4.2 says the following. If you have integrable functions, then the following statements automatically apply. All right, so the first ones, if we have a c times f of x and a d times g of x, and we have this integral notation with this a and b in front, we can separate it just like we did with limits, just like we did with derivatives. <coughs> We can pull constant multipliers, C and D out in front. We can separate addition into two sec separate integrals. We did that with derivatives, right? We can separate addition into two separate derivatives of addition. We can take the constant multiplier rule and we can ignore the constant, so to speak, and only focus on the variable part of that, take its derivative, and multiply it by the constant when we're done. That's the first one. The second one is a little bit different, though. And it deserves a picture in order to justify what it's saying. The second one says that if you have a C that is between A and B. So let me draw the picture at the top. So if you have A here, and you have B here, and you have C somewhere in between. That if I were to find the area between A and B, it would be the same as finding the area between A and C and then adding it to the area between C and D. In other words, I can break the interval up into pieces and I can find the area that way. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, that's a really good fact to have and we're going to use it when we have a point in between where things aren't continuous. Can you imagine having a hole in the graph? Well, that would make it not continuous, right? Well, what I could do is I could simply find the area up to the port where there's a discontinuity, and then I could do it on the other half, and then I could add those two pieces together. That's what this theorem's port part two tells us, is that I have the ability to break it apart into two pieces that I can find the information for and then add them together. Okay, is everybody good with those two theorems? They make sense all right? Okay, let's actually see one at play. <coughs> This right here is not asking you to do an integration like I'm going to ask you to do on your quiz today. It's not what it says. So be really careful when you look at directions that you follow the directions they're asking for. This says, give an, it shouldn't say and, it should say an, give an area interpretation of the integral. In other words, tell me what this means. What does this notation mean that I'm doing? So let's go just piece by piece. What do the zero and the two tell us for this, this question? What do they mean? It's taking, we're finding the area from zero to zero to two. Exactly. They give us an interval, right? They tell us that we're going from zero to two on the which axis? The x axis, right. So we're going to write that down. We'll just start, you know, sort of reading this from left to right. So This is the area from, and we'll just write x equals 0 to x equals 2. Okay, the area of what? What do you think, Jen? Do you have an idea? Okay, it's whatever x cubed minus 1 is, so it's the area, and it's really between, so I'm going to use the word between, between our function, this one's x cubed minus 1, and what? Where, and the x-axis, and the x-axis. And that's all there is to it. Now, that's not exactly the definition or the description I have written down in my notes. I can read you what I have written down, too. Let's see what I have written down. All right, so when I wrote this down before, I wrote, this is the difference in the area trapped between the curve, that's the x cubed minus 1, and the x-axis from 0 to 2. That's what it is. Everybody good with that? Make sense? Okay. Very good. Any questions before I go to the next one? All right. Now, this one, we want to take a look 
at it from a different perspective. In particular, we're sort of going the other direction. This one says, write the given total area as an integral or sum of integrals. Now, the fact that this says total area is important, and I'll show you what I mean by that, OK? But the idea goes back to that same description that we had sort of in reverse from the first problem. This one says we want the area above the x-axis and below y equals 4 minus x squared. So write down what you think notationally you would be finding to give this description. Give it a try. We'll see what we have, and then we'll make sure everybody has the right thing, okay? So what do you think notationally that would look like? There's something that's blatantly omitted here. We'll discuss it if you're not sure how to deal with it, but write down what you can for this so far. Everybody have a script S. Yeah? Something like that. That's part of this, right? Let's skip over the numbers at the top and the bottom for a minute. What's after the numbers? Right. The 4 minus x squared, that's our function. Dx. Does everybody have that? That part okay? This one doesn't give us numbers, right? How are we going to find them? Any thoughts? Uh, it's a good idea. It's not going to give us what we need, though. We've done a lot of things where we take them and set them equal to zero, so that's a good thought, yeah. Do you have an idea, Yosef? What's that? With limits. Uh, yeah, we could think about limits, but it's not going to give us the numbers on the top and the bottom yet. We have to know those numbers before we can do limits, actually. Again, a good thought. We've done a lot with limits. Any other thoughts? There's something in the description at the top that tells us what to do. Or, I'm sorry, in the number two, right after where it says how we're finding this area. What does it say we're wanting to find? The area of where? Above. above. That's really important. How am I going to figure out where this is above? You're going to graph it. You got it. All right, grab your calculator if you don't have it on already. Let's take a look at the graph. And if you don't and you just know what this graph looks like, that's fine too. What basic shape does this graph have? You should know that looking at the equation. It's a parabola, right? Parabola opening how? Downward. Downward. Okay, so we've got an upside down U shaped. And then what does that 4 do? It moves it up, it moves it up along the Y axis 4. So your picture looks something <laughs> sketching like that. Does that look right? Okay, so if you've got your calculator open and you want to find the locations here, you can do that. You're finding this place and this place. Agreed? Because those are the locations where it starts being <coughs> not below and above. And on the other side, it stops, and on the right hand side, it stops being above and it starts being below. That's the, the end points of the interval that matches this area. And this area is the description that I'm given. Is everybody good with that? Okay. So if you're looking at that and you're tracing along, you can find those locations. So let's actually look at that. What do you think that they are? Two and negative two are correct. <coughs> Now let's say for some odd reason you forgot your calculator. What else could you do algebraically to find out those locations? There's your set equal to zero that you were talking about, right, Allison? What could you set equal to zero, though? Yeah. You could just set the function itself equal to zero and solve it. And if you do, you'll still get the plus or minus two. That's the location where we hit the x-axis. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, Jen. Um, whenever you put the numbers down, like with the, the S, mm -hmm. does it matter like what order they are? Great question. Down? It does. The lower number is where you start, so the left-hand endpoint, 
and the upper number, the one at the top, is where you end. So we are going from left to right. Yeah, did you guys get that? So it does matter where the negative two and the two will be. If you put them in backwards, it will give you the same answer, but it will give you a negative of the answer you should be getting. So the numerical value you would get is correct, but the wrong sign will happen, and we'll talk more about why that happens. I think it's in the next section. I don't think it's this one. Yeah, it's the next section. Let me mention one more thing about the word total here, because I mentioned it when I said I'm going to talk about that word total. Here's what happens when you calculate this, and again, we'll see why this happens in the next section. If you're finding area above the curve, like we just shaded in here, that's considered positive area. If the area is below the curve, what do you think it actually calculates? It calculates it as negative. You guys with me? So let's go back just a second on this problem, and I want you to take a graph, and I want you to look at what happens to x cubed minus 1 between 0 and 2. Graph this, and we're going to add to our description from the last piece but I wanted it to happen after we'd done the next example. What does this graph look like between 0 and 2? It actually has some area where it's negative, doesn't it? It's the x cubed graph, but it's shifted down 1. Um, and so, let me see if I wrote a picture of it down. I did. It looks something like this on that interval only. It's got more to it, but between 0 and 1. So, or between 0 and 2. So it actually is giving you this piece and this piece. Those would be the trapped areas. But it's not going to find the total area of those pieces, is it? What it's going to do, if I calculate it, is it's going to say that this area is negative and this area is positive. And what happens when you add positives and negatives together? Yeah, there's some canceling going on, right? Part of those value that you're getting cancels because one's positive, one's negative. All right, cool. So when we find the area from 0 to 2 between negative or from x cubed minus 1 and the x-axis, that's not exactly what this is finding, is it? It's not finding the total area. So let's do a revision on what we wrote to accurately display what it finds because we know part of it's positive and part of it's negative. It still finds area but it finds the difference. In the area above the x-axis, and the area below the x <coughs> axis. And still, somewhere in here, we can say between x equals 0 and x equals 2. I'll just write it at the end since I haven't written it before. Make sense? So this calculation does, I, I use the word net area. It calculates somehow a net area instead of the actual area. Because the actual area should add these two pieces together, right? As though they were both positive amounts. But the calculation that we're going to be doing later is going to count negative for what's underneath and positive for what's above. Um, the applications for what we use this for don't show up until how to in your textbook. Um, unfortunately, there's not applications for what this looks like until you get to Calc 2. Yeah, sorry about that. Something for next semester, right, Jen? Look forward to exciting stuff. No? No? Oh, what a bum. Okay, let's look at example three. Same kind of thing. This is piggybacking on kind of what we just did because it tells us we're going to use a calculator, right? We're going to sketch something. Sketch the area corresponding to the integral from 2 to 4 of x squared minus x. Okay, so your calculator's involved, right? 
You bet. All right, so take your calculator. Put into your calculator x squared minus x. And we're only going from 2 to 4. I mean, you can draw more of the curve, and that's totally fine. But we want to make sure that the area that we're going to be corresponding to our picture is only between 2 and 4. <coughs> All right, so what is the shape of this curve? <coughs> it is a parabola. All right. And the parabola, um, if you look in the standard window, is off your screen probably on your calculator, right? If you're only going up to x equals to 10. So you might need to expand your screen a little bit or at least use your imagination to picture what's going to be happening. So my picture looks something like this. Oh, that's not right. I'm not giving a good picture. Let me try again. Something like that, maybe. Does that look accurate with what yours is? Does that look okay? All right. Do you know where it starts and where it stops at 2 and 10? Because we probably should mark those. It starts at 2, 2, and it ends at 2, 12. 4, 12. Four, sorry, 4, 12. Yes, thank you. I just said that wrong. You're right. And how would we get those if we didn't see them? How did you get them, Snyder? You graphed them. It's okay. If you didn't graph it or if you weren't tracing it very accurately, <coughs> you got it. You could plug in 2 into the function. 2 squared minus 2 would be, would be 2. And you could plug in 4. 4 squared minus 4 would be the, six, the 12. So 16 minus 4 would be 12. And then how is this going to be shaded according to the description or sketch the area? You're going to start at 2 right here. You're going to end at 4. And then you're going to do what? You're going to shade it in, right? This is the area that it's been referring to. That's it. That's all the problem's asking for. Okay? All right, the next one is going to use these formulas down here in parts one and two to make make assumptions, okay? That's what we're going to be using. So don't try and connect things just yet. I promise we're going to connect all of this together in its next section. 4.5 connects all the dots so far. But we're still trying to make more um, connections before we connect all the dots. All right, this one says to evaluate the integral using the following values. We're told that the integral from 2 to 4 of x cubed dx is 60. The integral from 2 to 4 of x dx is 6 and the integral from 2 to 4 of dx all by itself is 2. So far, so good? Now, where did those numbers come from? Oh, I can show you, but that's in 4.5. Okay, so right now, we're just giving you those facts and asking you to use the properties to connect them. All right? So if I'm wanting, this is kind of like what we did in the limits section with the summation rules, right? Not the limit section, but the summation rules section. We're wanting to split these pieces apart so that we can use the rules that are given at the beginning. Does that make sense? Okay. So that first property over here, number one, says that I'm allowed to pull numbers and coefficients out in front, and I'm allowed to separate addition and subtraction. I know it doesn't say that, but subtraction as well, into two different pieces. So that's exactly what I'm going to do with these functions. So the first one I'm going to write is I'm going to separate this into the integral of 4. I need to pull something out in front. What's going to come out in front? The 4? What's going to go inside of the script S? The x cubed. And then I need to have a dx written there. OK? This is the first piece. And then I'm going to have a minus sign because there's subtraction after that. What will I be subtracting? Careful. Integral. We need that integral first, OK? And then, Jen, what are we going to subtract? x with a dx. dx. And do you need all those details? Yes. yes. You need all those details on there. And then we've got another subtraction. Now here's the one that looks funny. We're going to subtract. I'm going to have a script s with the 2 and the 4, and I'm going to have a dx. What's going to go in front of my script s? 7. Seven. What's going to go inside? 
technically nothing. We're not going to write anything in there, but what's there is the number one. So if it helps you to see it, you can write a one. If you don't want to write it, that's fine too. This is the separation, which looks and feels weird. Agreed? I think it feels weird. Looks awkward. But each one of these now matches pieces that I have information about. Agreed? So when I'm substituting in, I'm kind of flat out replace the whole thing with the number that I'm told equals it. So the four stays in front. And what is the integral from two to four of x cubed dx? 60. And I'm gonna subtract. And what is the integral from two to four of x dx? Six. Six. And I'm gonna subtract seven. And what is the integral from two to four of dx? Two. The problem just turns into addition and subtraction, doesn't it? Well, it's a multiplication, I guess. Yep. Why didn't we write the two on the last one, on the last, you know, when it broke it up? And you said there's a one there. What two? Well, like, um, the information that was given, dx equals two. Oh, that's the, that's the value that this equals, just like we didn't write the six or the 60 until this step. Okay. Yes. So we use it, we use it after we've substituted all, or separated all the pieces, we use it as a substitution. All right, so what is four times 60 minus six <coughs> minus seven times two? 220, fantastic. All right, any questions on that? All right, here's the last piece. This last piece is using geometry, okay? So it's not a terribly difficult question, but you do have to employ some prior knowledge kind of stuff. So it may be things that you don't remember, but I promise we can break it down into things you probably do. All right, so this one says, use a geometric formula, okay, to compute the integral. Well, in order to know which geometric formula, you're probably gonna have to take a look at the picture that you're getting when you create this. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to sketch this image. This image is supposed to be going from zero to two And it's the graph of 3x plus 4. So I'm going from 0 out to 2 of 3x plus 4. What does the graph of 3x plus 4 look like? It's a line. Very good. What's the y-intercept? 4. Yeah, because it says 3x plus 4. So 1, 2, 3, 4. So I'm actually hitting the y-axis right here. Where will I be when x is equal to 2? What's the y value when x is 2? 10. 10. How'd you get 10, Josh? Two. Yeah, you plugged in 2. So my scale's not quite right, but this is what we're going to presume to be 10. Okay? So I'm starting at 4 on the y-axis, 0, 4, and then I'm ending at 2, 10. And what this formula that I'm given here, what this calculation is supposed to be finding, is this area, right? I've got it boxed in, let me shade it in. <coughs> supposed to be finding the area of that shape. There are two ways, at least, to find the area of that shape. What in the world is that shape? It is a trapezoid. So one way to do this is to remember the formula for trapezoids. That might not be a formula that you just have committed to memory and quick at your recall. If I didn't want to or couldn't think of how to use the formula for trapezoids here, what's another thing I could do? You could break it up into a square or a rectangle. I think this will be a rectangle and a triangle. Okay, so let's do it from both perspectives so you can see both of them work. Let me do the trapezoid first since that's the one you guys saw first. And again, if you don't think through this formula, that's totally cool because we can do it with squares and triangles or rectangles and triangles, which you do remember areas for probably at the recall. Does anybody remember the area of a trapezoid formula? Anybody? It's okay. Let me remind you. It's one half. It's the sum of the bases, B1 plus B2. We'll identify that on the picture times the height. That's the formula for area of a trapezoid. Uh, and it, it comes from the formulas for triangles and rectangles. So, 
All right, over here on our picture, do you remember what base one and base two would be on the picture of a trapezoid? It's the parallel lines, okay? So it would be uh, this length right here, this would be B1, and this length right here, and this is B2, or you could call them B1 and B2 reverse, it doesn't matter. So all it is is it's the length of those two pieces. What would the height be? Yeah, it's the length between them, right? It's this right here is the height. It almost looks like it's a, recta or a, a trapezoid sort of laying on its side, if I call that the height. But the height really is just the distance between those parallel lines. Everybody good with that? Okay, so let's put the numbers in and calculate this. So what is B1? Four. What is B2? Ten. And what is H? Two. Two. All right, calculate. Tell me what you get. Fourteen. That sounds good. Is everybody good with that? Okay, let's take that same picture and break it apart differently, like you guys mentioned. So we can ignore my B1, my B2. You can ignore my H as well. Let's see if I can kind of sketch on over it. There we go. That's one way to get rid of it, right? Just like white out on a piece of paper. We're going to break it up. Where, how would I have to break it up so that I end up with a triangle and a rectangle? Josh, you mentioned breaking it up. What would you do? Right, exactly. So I take the number four and I sort of cut it right there, right? And if I cut it right there, I end up with a rectangle at the bottom and a triangle along the top. Okay, does everybody see those two shapes okay? My picture was not very good with how I drew my straight lines, but you've got the image in your mind, right? Awesome. Okay, so let's look at finding the area of a rectangle plus a triangle. So let's just remember formulas first. What's the area of a rectangle formula? Length times width. What's the area of a triangle formula? We usually call it one half base times height. Okay, so let's do our rectangle first. Here's my rectangle down here. What is the length and width of my formula? Sorry. All right, so two is one of the dimensions, whichever one, and four is the other one. Everybody good with that? Awesome. All right, how about base and height for a triangle? All right, so one of them is two, just like the two on the width of the triangle or of the rectangle. The other one is six. And again, from the picture, one of them is right here and one of them is right here. Just like this one's here and this one's here, or some version of that. So, and again, it doesn't matter the order because this is all multiplication, which is commutative, it means that the order doesn't matter. So we have two times six. All right, two times four is eight. What is one half times two times six? That is six for a grand total of 14. Same as we got from the other piece. So don't be afraid to break things apart into area formulas that you know. Right? There's nothing wrong with that. Right? Everything you're doing will be done, will be able to be done with rectangles, triangles, and trapezoids, pretty much. They're not asking you to do anything with shapes that you don't have. For instance, if you had a parabola curve, you don't have any geometric formulas that would work with that, right? So if they're asking this kind of a question, they're intending that you're breaking it apart into linear, some kind of linear boxes of some sort, okay? Any questions? Jen? Can you, uh, can you use the like, approximation when we're doing the other sections to find a, like, an approximation? Um, if you were finding an approximation, yeah, I've asked for an approximation, but this one said to use geometric figures. So you want to make sure you're using a figure that actually matches the picture that you've got. Yeah, so if you were approximating, like left and right and that. you could. And on this one, if you found the midpoint on this one, it would actually would work to be the exact same number. And, and if you visually picture it, you can kind of figure out why, is that it would break this triangle if I drew it well. Mm -hmm. It would break the triangle in half, and you'd have the exact same amount above as you did below missing, and it would balance out. That's because it's a rectangle that it turns into, actually. Yeah, because you've got a line on the top. All right, anything else? Great.